Losing card advantage is something players always try to avoid, so a card making you go minus one is usually a death sentence. Despite this, some cards that have you go minus one have still made their mark on the game, and in this list we're going to go over some of the best of that bunch. And at number 10, we have Forbidden Orchard. This is a land that you can tap for one mana of any color, and whenever you tap it for mana, an opponent creates a 1-1 colorless spirit token. Orchard is a land that's pretty bad at making mana, as giving your opponent a free 1-1 every time you tap is way too high of a cost. However, the ability to give your opponent a creature can be used to your advantage, particularly with Oath of the Druids. Oath is an enchantment with a mana cost of 1 and 1 green with the ability where, at the beginning of each player's upkeep, if that player has less creatures than their opponent, they reveal cards on top of their deck until they reveal a creature card, put that card into the battlefield, and then put the rest into the graveyard. Oath of Druids is a really powerful way to cheat giant threats into play. However, you need your opponent to have a creature on the field for it to trigger, and you have to build your deck without many creatures to make sure that you hit the creature you want. As a result, it really needs Forbidden Orchard to make it work. So if this combo is so good, why is Forbidden Orchard so low on this list? Well, there really aren't enough ways to make use of it outside of Oath of Druids, and Oath is only legal in Vintage due to being banned in Legacy. As a result, Forbidden Orchard sees pretty limited play, but being so good in a format like Vintage earns it a spot on this list, just not a very high one. And at number 9, we have Tasha's Hideous Laughter. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of 1 and 2 blue, with the effect where each opponent exile cards from the top of their library until they exile cards with a total mana value of 20. The ability to mill a whole bunch of cards from your opponent's deck is generally very bad, unless it's your win condition. Tasha's has only really seen play in dedicated mill decks. In these decks, Tasha's has a lot going for it. Exiling the cards rather than putting them to the graveyard is way better, because there are tons of cards that love being in the graveyard. Additionally, Tasha's can usually mill a huge number of cards. The average mana cost of cards gets lower and lower the more powerful formats get. In modern, most cards cost 1 or 2 mana, combining with lands and the average Tasha will mill a third of someone's library, possibly even more if you're lucky. Now, there are a ton of cards that are good at milling cards, such as Archive Trap, but they all see play together anyway and would qualify for this video, so it's not all that important which ones show up on this list. Tasha's was chosen mostly because it exiles, which is a really good upside. Unfortunately, mill decks aren't the most powerful, so Tasha's ended up at a pretty low spot on this list. And at number 8, we have Show and Tell. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of 2 and 1 blue that lets each player put an artifact, creature, enchantment, or land from their hand onto the battlefield. Starting here, we're getting all the really good cards in this list. Show and Tell is a really cheap way to cheat just about any threat you want into play. Interestingly, Show and Tell was kind of a bad card for a long time, mostly because the best threats to cheat out simply weren't good enough. Sure, getting them for just 3 mana was a great deal, but letting your opponent put something to play 2 on top of the card making go minus 1 was bad enough to stop it from being good. However, once cards like Emrakul were printed, Show and Tell became a huge threat. When facing down a giant 15-15 flyer that annihilates their board, no threat your opponent can put into play really matters. Now, if your opponent has Emrakul as well, casting Show and Tell would be awful. The thing is, most decks aren't prepared for a Show and Tell to resolve, and won't be playing cards like Emrakul, so they'll probably be playing one or two mana creatures into play while you get a giant game-ending monster. And this is even more true in older formats like Legacy. Show and Tell has been a meta threat for years in that format, to such a degree that people often have specific sideboard plans just for it. And at number 7, we have Faithless Looting. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of 1 red that allows you to draw 2 cards and then discard 2 cards. It also has a flashback cost of 2 and 1 red, so you can cast it for your graveyard for the cost, but you have to exile it afterwards. While this card is a strict negative 1 in card advantage, it's extremely easy to offset the cost. Like we said earlier, there are a lot of cards that love to be in your graveyard. Looting was a great card for these decks, as it was great at both helping you find payoffs and putting cards into the graveyard for later. Outside of decks dedicated to graveyard shenanigans, Faithless Looting still saw a ton of play. Hollow One is a creature that costs 2 less for each card you've discarded this turn, and Looting slotted right into the deck as another way to let you discard cards and find your Hollow Ones. Another deck that used Looting to great effect was Mardu Pyromancer. This deck is named after the color combination White Black Red, which is called Mardi by the community, and the star of the show Young Pyromancer. This is a 2-1 one for 1 and 1 red that makes you a 1-1 one, one elemental token each time you cast an instant or sorcery. So, when you cast your looting, you get a 1-1 one, one out of the deal, which would offset the card disadvantage. Even with this rather minor synergy, Faithless Looting was a house in the deck. That's the thing. While people did build around looting, it was good enough at simply finding you the cards you wanted that it would have been fine without those synergies. The fact that it helped you find all the cards you wanted while also filling your graveyard made it too good for the modern format, which is why it was banned in 2019. 
Now, it sees less play in formats like Vintage and Legacy, but it's still seen consistent play as one of the best ways to throw cards into the graveyard. And at number 6, we have Doomsday. This is a sorcery the mana costs a 3 black, with the effect where you search your deck and graveyard for 5 cards, exile the rest, and then put them on the top of your library in any order, and then you lose half of your life. Doomsday is a pretty scary card to cast. Not only does it have your life total, it also gives you 5 cards to try and win the game with before you deck yourself out. The thing is, knowing the exact 5 cards in your deck, and knowing exactly what order they're in, is really strong. It's even better with cards like Thassa's Oracle, a creature with the mana cost of 2 blue that wins you the game when it enters the battlefield if you have an empty deck. These cards obviously work really well together, and when you combine them with really strong draw spells like Ancestral Recall, it becomes really easy to draw to those last 5 cards of your deck. As a result, Doomsday has been the backbone of combo decks in Legacy and Vintage for years, even seen play before the formats were even called Legacy and Vintage. The combo lines have changed over the years, but the power of Doomsday has not. So, why is Doomsday only at number 6? Mostly just because there is some really stiff competition, but Doomsday isn't quite as versatile as the higher spots on this list. And at number 5, we have Force of Will. This is an instant with a mana cost of 3 and 2 blue, but you can cast it by exiling a blue card from your hand and paying 1 life rather than paying its mana cost, and it lets you counter target spell. This is one of the best counter spells ever printed. One of the most important things about this card is that since it doesn't cost any mana, you can cast it on your opponent's first turn when you're going second. This allows Force of Will to stop incredibly fast turn 1 kill combo decks. In fact, this is the main role of Force in Legacy and Vintage, where there are tons of these kinds of combos. Even better, these combos usually take a lot of resources to put together, and if they're stopped, they'll almost be completely out of gas. This means that a single Force of Will can win you the game sometimes. Outside of punishing fast combo decks, Force of Will is used as a powerful tempo play by blue decks to stop key spells from resolving. The ability to counter a spell for no mana is so strong that players are more than happy to throw a card away to get it. While we're here, we should probably give a quick mention to Force of Negation, a very similar card that is often played alongside Force of Will. Force of Negation costs 1 and 2 blue, can be cast by exiling a blue card from your hand, but only if it's not your turn, and can only counter non-creature spells. Even with these restrictions, it has been a staple in just about every format it's legal in ever since it was printed. Force of Will is one of the most important cards in Legacy and Vintage, and one of the only reasons the format is even playable, as without it, the formats would be run by turn 1 kill combo decks. And speaking of OTKs... And at number 4, we have Channel. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of 2 green and the effect that for the rest of the turn, you can pay 1 life to add 1 colorless mana. This is a really strong effect, even in a fairly generic deck that simply wants to use Channel to cheat out a bunch of really big threats. However, Channel is most well known for being a big part of the first ever combo deck in all of Magic. How the combo worked is you would use all the busted artifact ramp in the early days of the game to cast Channel, pump all of your life into it to make 20 mana, and then cast a Fireball, a sorcery which deals X damage to any target, where X is however much mana you pay. This would let you deal 20 damage to your opponent in the first turn of the game. Even worse, in the early days of Magic, there wasn't such a thing as a playset for any card. If you wanted to run 20 channels and 20 fireballs, you could. And that's exactly what people did. This combo was so good that not only did Wizards change the rules around deck building by implementing the playset rule, they also started printing cards like Force of Will to stop these kinds of combos. Now, Channel doesn't see any play anymore, though that's largely due to being banned in everything but Vintage, where it's restricted to one copy. With only one channel in your deck, it's really not worth trying to combo off with, but being a big part of the first combo in Magic certainly earns it a spot on this list. And at number 3, we have Vampiric Tutor. This is an instant with a mana cost of 1 black that allows you to search your library for a card, shuffle, then put it on top of your deck, and lose 2 life. Vampiric Tutor is the cheapest tutor in the game, with the rest of the competition being at sorcery speed or only letting you find certain cards. Finding any card you want for just 1 mana is incredibly strong. Beyond simply finding the removal spell or draw spell you need to get back in the game, one of the best uses is simply finding any of one of the many combo pieces we've mentioned up until now, and simply using it to win the game. Now, Vampiric Tutor is great, but it's almost too strong for its own good. You see, Vampiric Tutor is banned in Legacy, restricted to 1 in Vintage, and too old to be in any of the other formats, so it doesn't actually see too much play. Especially since it has to compete with Demonic Tutor, a 2 mana sorcery that tutors a card directly to your hand. Still, Vampiric Tutor is far too strong to be allowed in other formats, which is why it's banned in Legacy and restricted in Vintage along with most of the other good tutors. And at number 2, we have Tinker. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of 2 and 1 blue, with an additional cost that you have to sacrifice an artifact 
and it allows you to search your library for an artifact and put it into the battlefield. The thing to note about this card is that it doesn't care how much mana you spent on the artifact you sacrificed, or how much the artifact you find costs. This means that you can sacrifice a 0 mana artifact and go find a 12 mana Blightsteel Colossus. The ability to power out any artifact you want for so little mana is broken on the face of it. It's essentially a 1 card combo that only asks for you to run a few artifacts in your deck to sacrifice it. Unlike other cards that cheat threats into play, like show and tell, Tinker is also insanely versatile, essentially being a demonic tutor and a show and tell all in one. It can find you whatever happens to be the best in any situation, from Bolas' Citadel to go off and cast your entire deck, Blightstow Colossus to kill your opponent in one hit, or Time Volt to take infinite turns with Voltaic Key. Despite all this power, there is still one card that requires you to go minus one that's even more powerful. And at number one, we have Black Lotus. This is a zero mana artifact that lets you tap and sacrifice it to add three mana of any one color. This is one of the strongest cards in all of Magic. This card is part of the so-called Power 9, a group of nine of the strongest cards in the entire game that were printed in Alpha, the very first set of the game, and they're all still way too good even today. Getting extra mana is one of the strongest things in the entire game. Heavily nerfed versions of Black Lotus, such as Lotus Petal, see tons of play for their ability to power out combo plays even a turn earlier. Black Lotus gives you so much mana that you can accelerate combo plays with insane speed off of just a single Lotus. For example, if you have a Lotus and a Time Twister, you can cast Time Twister off your Lotus, and if you have any other zero mana ramp or copies of Lotus, you'll actually go up both cards and mana. This is only one of tons of interactions that put you way far ahead as early as the first turn of the game, or more often than not, simply win it right away. In fact, Black Lotus was commonly used as part of the Channel Fireball combo, as it was the easiest way to get 4 mana you needed to pull the combo off. Black Lotus is one of those cards that only gets more broken as more and more cards get printed. Before we wrap up, we should probably also mention the other 0 mana ramp cards that make you go minus 1, specifically Simeon and Elvish Spirit Guide, Mox Diamond, Chrome Mox, Lotus Petal, and Lion's Eye Diamond. All of these cards are good, and they might have made into the list as well, but their function is too similar to Black Lotus to really warrant talking about on their own spots. Black Lotus, as well as the rest of the Power 9, are pretty much all played at the allowed one copy in every vintage deck, and simply banned everywhere else. One more quick piece of trivia, Black Lotus is the single most expensive magic card, with mint condition lotuses going for upwards of $100,000. Largely due to how iconic of a card it is, and its iconic status comes from just how powerful it is. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any cards you think we may have missed, or have ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, leave those in comments down below.